Hi everyone and welcome back. In this chapter, chapter four in microbiology for surgical technologists, we are going to be talking about prokaryotes. Uh, so some things we're going to discuss about prokaryotes is we're going to distinguish between archaea and bacteria. We're gonna compare and contrast different bacterial morphologies. So we're gonna talk about different shapes and characteristics of prokaryotes and how bacteria are classified. And then we're going to finish up by discussing the significance of spore formation. So this chapter is really gonna piggyback off of what we've already been talking about and just how important it is to understand the characteristics associated with these different microorganisms. And um, so, we're going to be talking more about bacteria specifically in this lecture and how they behave so that we can find ways to neutralize them and reduce the potential for surgical site infections. So I did a quick little Google search just to find out how many prokaryotes there are on Earth. And uh, the little Google search that I did said there's anywhere from 2.5 to 25 times 10 to the 29th. So that's like 25 followed by 29 zeros. So um, yeah, that's a lot. And uh, there's two domains of prokaryotes that we're gonna be talking about, archaea and bacteria. And archaea um, are different from bacteria and eukaryotes um, because they like extreme environments. And two common types are halophiles and thermophiles. And then we also have methagenes and thermoacidophiles. So they like these environments that um, are really salty, like um, halophiles love uh, salty environments, or we have ones that like environments like thermophiles that are hot and very uh, low pH, right? Very acidic pH. Or there's those that live in glaciers or those that live near the volcanic vents in the oceans or where there's these very extreme levels of gases like methane gases. And so we refer to these little guys as Ex, um, extremophiles. So scientists have grouped bacteria into many different categories based on all of their amazing characteristics. And um, the first one is morphology. So we're going to talk about morphology, which is basically the shape of bacteria. We're going to talk a little bit more about staining and growth and motility. And then we're gonna look at the aspects of proteins, genetics, nutritional requirements, and then finish up by talking about pathogenicity. Like humans, bacteria come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, so first we're gonna talk about morphology, then we'll talk a little bit more about staining and growth. So for different shapes and different um, arrangements, um, we refer to that as the morphology. And some common ones that were identified by Van Leeuwenhoek um, are caucus, bacillus, and spiral. And so if you look at this image that I have in the middle of the screen, the green ones are the cocci, which is plural, for caucus, and those are our round bacteria. And we have um, monococcus, which would be one, and then we have other arrangements like diplococci, which is two, and um, uh, an example of this would be the Streptococcus pneumoniae, and then we have 
tetracocci, which isn't on this slide, but that would be three uh, or four, excuse me. And then we have, oh, the, it's called tetrad on this slide. And then tharsine, which is a cubic group of eight, and it is on the slide as well. And then um, we have chains which are called streptococci, and we have groups which are called staphylococci or clusters. And so the way I remember between the two is strep sounds like strip, so I remember that's a chain. And then staff, like a staff meeting, we would have a group of people together or a cluster of people. And um, that uh, a staff, whether it is staphylococcus or staphylobacillus, um, it still means a group. So um, just a little tidbit of how to remember that. And then we have bacillus, and bacillus is rod-shaped bacteria. So we could have one bacillus, which is a monobacillus. We could have two that are hooked together. That would be diplobacillus. And then we can have a chain of bacillus, which uh, going back to that is streptobacillus. And uh, then another a type of bacillus and arrangement is palisade and that's in like a stack like you would think about how you would stack uh, logs up or something that would be a palisade and then other various types we have vibrios that are kind of comma shaped we have um, other pleomorphic forms where they, they these are the shape shifters of bacteria they have the ability to change shape depending upon their environment um, spirilla is like a um, a corkscrew shaped uh, type of bacteria and the less flexible ones are called spirillum and the more flexible ones are called the spirochettes Okay, so um, various uh, types of bacteria are classified this way when we look at them under the microscope can give us a good idea of what type of bacteria it actually is. Now staining. We already talked about gram staining, gram positive and gram negative. Now gram positive, remember, stains like a dark bluey purple, and then gram negative is going to be kind of our pinkish red. Now positive is because we have that thick, uh, thicker wall of the bacteria, and the gram negative not so much. All right, so this helps to provide one of the standards of determining preliminary identity and path, pathogeni pathogenicity of bacteria, okay? So how harmful they are to us, right? Um, and so physicians can prescribe preliminary antibiotic therapy based on gram staining um, and on a generalization of bacterial susceptibility, like there's only certain um, bacteria that typically colonize in the nose or on the skin or in the urinary tract or those types of things. And so they can kind of, um, you know, get close as far as what type of antibiotic would be needed to treat that. And then growth, growth and motility, right? So growth, um, um, when we isolate and colonate these bacteria on auger, like we talked about before, we can um, identify them, we can count them, we can get a better understanding of what they are and then what we're going to need to treat them. And uh, they all have affinity to different environments, right? Like we talked about before. And then the ability of a microbe to move itself, right, is called its motility. And uh, this is accomplished by two ways. One by flagella, and that's the little whippy tail, and then by axial filaments. And uh, so most of the spiral shaped ones are motile, while, um, and, uh, only a few species of bacilli are motile, and cocci are typically non-motile for the most part. Oh, oh, and then down here I wanted to show you this other image is a mycoplasm, 
And mycoplasms can be shaped in rings and in stars and, um, and in spheres. And so I saw this ringed one and I thought it looked really cool. So this is an example of a, a ring-shaped mycoplasm. Again, um, not all bacteria are motile or have those filaments or flagella. Um, cocci are typically not mobile, motile, um, and the spiral-shaped ones are commonly motile with just a few bacilli being motile. So let's talk about nutritional requirements and oxygen requirements. So the nutritional requirements and oxygen requirements are another tool for classifying microbes. Um, and so when we have um, uh, bacteria, fungi, and algae um, are examples of recyclers on our planet. And they recycle essential life elements like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, sulfur, and some greenhouse gases that exist in our atmosphere as well. And so there are some suffixes and prefixes that we need to be familiar with. And the suffix troph means feeder and uh, or a nutritional source and then whatever prefix we attach to that is going to describe their source of energy that they use so prokaryotes are typically classified in two ways either autotroph meaning they're a self feeder or heterotroph meaning they're a different or other feeder so heterotrophs they're going to utilize light or chemicals to produce their own nutrients. And then they also have subclassification. So are they going to use light or chemicals? If they're going to use light, they're phototrophs. And if they're going to use chemicals, they are chemotrophs. Okay, so um, Heterotrophs, on the other hand, are also known as organotrophs, and they consume organic materials such as dead and decomposing plants and animals. These are our composters, okay, the heterotrophs. So autotrophs, they typically use carbon dioxide as their source of carbon, and lithotropes are going to use um, inorganic compounds like minerals to meet their carbon needs. Now, photoautotrophs, such as plants and algae and cyanobacteria, are going to use light as their energy source, photo, and carbon dioxide as their, um, and carbon dioxide, um, because they're autotrophs, right? So photoheterotrophs are going to use light as an energy source and organic compounds such as alcohols and carbohydrates as their sources of carbon. And uh, then we have our chemotrophs. Our chemotrophs um, such as hydrogen, iron, and sulfur bacteria use chemicals as energy sources and carbon dioxide as their carbon source. Remember, autotroph self-feeder typically utilizes either light or chemicals. So uh, then we have our chemolithotrophs, and these little guys, they get their energy from oxidation of inorganic compounds and their carbon from CO2. If we have a chemoheterotroph, then we have um, uh, bacteria, uh, all fungi, protozoa, and uh, all animals that use chemicals as their energy source, and then organ organic compounds for their carbon source. And then we also have saprophytes. And saprophytes are um, the ones that obtain organic nutrients from those dead and decaying, uh, dead and decaying matter, matter. And then parasites, they're going to feed off of a live host, a living host. 
Uh, so now let's uh, skip over and talk about oxygen requirements. So we have some bacteria that have to have oxygen. They're required to have it or they're required not to have it. And in that case, we call them obligates. So if you're obligated to have air, you are an obligate aerobe. And if you are obligated not to have air, you're an obligate anaerobe. Now there are microfills, and microfills require oxygen, but not nearly as much, like 5% of what, of what would normally be in room air. And then aerotolerant anaerobes are those that don't require oxygen. They can grow in its presence, but they grow better when they have uh, an environment that lacks oxygen altogether. And then we have facultative anaerobes. And facultative anaerobes, they're the ones that just really don't care. They're like meh, like it doesn't matter. Uh, and then lastly, capnophils. Capnophils are those that love um, an environment that is high in carbon dioxide. So while there are billions of microbes on the planet, uh, only a few thousand of them are pathogenic or harmful to humans. And a lot of these are what we refer to as opportunistic. And a good example of that, again, is Staphylococcus aureus, because it lives on our skin and it doesn't harm us unless there's some sort of breach in our skin. And then it be can become opportunistic. And, and this is one of the reasons that we do that surgical skin prep at, of our patient and one reason we do our surgical uh, scrub uh, before we go ahead and gown up so that we can reduce uh, some of that uh, bacteria from our skin. And uh, so uh, different bacteria have an affinity for different portals of entry, and there has to be a portal of entry. So we'll talk about the chain of infection, but one of the um, components of the chain of infection is a portal of entry. And if you take away a bacteria's ability to get in, then you break the chain of infection. As we said before, some bacteria are spore forming, not all of them. They form a spore as an extra protective measure. And then some bacteria's the way they um, actually cause infections and diseases by secreting exotoxins. So they will secrete a substance outside of themselves, but there are some bacteria that also create endotoxins and then they eventually, it's inside them and they eventually rupture and the endotoxins go out into our system or our tissues or whatever. Um, as far as metabolism, um, bacteria extract energy from their environment because they're living organisms. But because of that, they also secrete waste. And um, this can also uh, cause tissue damage and disease. Staphylococcus and Streptococcus um, have been identified according to the enzymes that they secrete. So again, this helps us to identify and classify the types of bacteria by the enzymes or the, the toxins they secrete, or sometimes by the substances that they produce. So some produce oxygen, um, others produce different gases like methane and carbon dioxide. But basically, the metabolic activities of prokaryotes, which are these very simple single cell organisms, are a lot similar to those of multicellular and more complex organisms of the eukaryote variety. Proteins. So we know that proteins are chains of amino acids, and these are typically enzymes, right? And um, if we look at um, these uh, enzyme, these amino acid sequences of organisms, we can compare them and we can determine how closely related they are. Um, and this will also help us to classify them. And then genetics, right? We, we already know that our genome is like the code, the recipe book for everything that is us. 
and it is no different with these little prokaryotes. So here we are looking at our lovely prokaryote, and we're going to talk about some anatomy of the prokaryote. So here you can see in this image this squiggly purple-like yarn in the middle of this thing, and that is actually the genetic material. So with us, um, and other multicellular organisms that are eukaryotes, we have this membrane-bound nucleus in the center of all of our cells. Well, these little guys don't have that, so they just kind of have this stuff kind of floating around um, inside them, and they usually have some way of propelling themselves, like a flagellum, and um, they... Uh, also have cytoplasm. You can see some ribosomes in there and their cell wall. Um, so we're going to talk about each of these um, characteristics uh, individually. All right, so as we discussed before, the bacterial cell wall, um, it can either be thicker or it could be a little bit thinner. And the thicker the wall, um, that gives us a gram-positive stain. The thinner the wall gives us a gram-negative stain. Um, what is this, the bacterial cell wall made out of? It's made out of this macromolecule and it's called peptidoglycan. And so um, antibi this is what antibiotics typically target is this bacterial cell wall. And uh, so the cytoplasmic membrane surrounds the cytoplasm uh, in the cell and uh, is also referred to as the plasma membrane. And this is where all the metabolic reactions occur. Uh, cellular respiration occurs in a special little part called the mesosome. So instead of mitochondria, they have mesosomes and there are these little fold, um, areas that fold inward, like these little pouch-like cavities into the cytoplasm. And this is where um, ATP is made. And then the capsule, the, the capsule is composed of something called glycocalyx. And uh, this layer is uh, referred to as the capsule uh, if it's strongly attached to the cell wall. If not, it's called a slime layer if it's loosely attached. And so different species have different com chemical compositions and uh, it's another way that we can classify them. Um, capsules and slime layers, they are helpful for the bacteria because they help to protect them against desiccation and environmental toxins. And they also give them ability to um, move along solid surfaces and sometimes allow the bacteria to attach to surfaces like mucous membrane or the surface of teeth uh, where they cannot be washed or flushed away. All right, so moving along with our discussion of the anatomy of the prokaryote, the cytoplasm is what is contained within the plasma membrane. And it's kind of like this gelatinous type substance. And inside there, there's also some kind of liquidy stuff, and that's called the cytosol. And um, in the cytosol, we have some awesome things kind of floating about. Um, we have some cytoplasmic particles like the ribosomes that are going to be responsible for, you know, um, producing uh, proteins and enzymes and all of that fun stuff similar to inside our cells. There may also be some little something somethings of nutrients and chemicals floating around in the cytoplasm, just little um, reserve nutrients. And in some marine bacteria, there um, are these little gases floating around, and that helps them to float. Is that not amazing? It's just crazy. Um, uh, and then uh, in the center, there is the genetic material that is located there in the nucleoid. And then the chromosomes. Uh, again, the chromosomes aren't surrounded by a nuclear membrane. They're just kind of in the middle of there. And uh, there's no, um, no protein materials. Um, it doesn't maintain a stable shape. Like I said, it's just kind of hanging out in the middle of there. It's a single strand of DNA. And uh, the way that it divides is by a process called binary fission. 
So um, the flagella are going to be attached to the cell, and again, they're responsible for movement. Um, sometimes we see them in rod-shaped bacteria and spiral-shaped bacteria, but not as much in round cocci bacteria. And so there's some different types of um, flagella for bacteria. One is the monotrichus, and monotrichus means one. Then there is the amphitrichus, and amphitrichus has one little flagella coming off from each end, which is very interesting. And then we have the lophotrichus, and the lophotrichus, it looks like it has some weird hairs coming out of one end, like four little flagellas on one end. And then you have the peritrichus, and the peritrichus is going to have little flagella kind of surrounding the entire capsule of itself. And then there are little tiny hairs called pili, or pilus for one, and these are common on gram uh, negative bacteria. And they're also known as fimbriate. Where else do we hear that? At the end of the fallopian tubes, right? They're thinner than flagella, but they're more rigid. Um, and they really don't provide motility. What they do is serve for a site of attachment for particular types of bacteria, and they provide them with a sex pillus and the ability to transfer genetic material from one to another through the process of conjugation. It's bacteria sex 101 right here, folks. Um, and then what else do pili do? They provide bacteria the ability to attach to other bacteria or surfaces such as the mucous membranes, okay? Um, then we're back to spore formation. So again, these spores are going to help protect these bacteria when they're in a dormant state, when the environment is kind of too harsh for them to be moving about and proliferating. And the formation of a spore is called sporulation. And this makes them a lot more difficult to kill. Now, the formation of a spore is not to be confused with reproduction, right? It's about bacterial survival. The environment is such that they can't survive and so they're going to hunker down for a while and they create this spore. And then when the situation improves, they shed their spore and they go about their business. Um, you know, and it's really important again for us to understand, um, you know, the, the difficulty of eliminating spores and that it's, um, really resistant to heat and chemicals and other methods of sterilization. Um, and then we use that biological indicator that I talked about that has a live spore in it that does have an affinity for heat, um, you know, just so that we can verify that the, that the sterilization um, was successful. So that's going to bring us to the end of our discussion about prokaryotes. I hope that it was helpful and that you fell just a little bit more in love with microbiology today.